Divine Truth Documentary Jesus, Mary and Others provide information to people or organizations that produce documentaries. In this video, Jesus and Mary are interviewed by Thomas Lita while traveling from Brisbane Airport to their home with Thomas and his cameraman Simon. This is Session 2, Part 2, filmed on the 9th of August 2013 in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Where I'm to put it in context, really, yeah, I think, and then context. if we... And also a bit of my history with my ex-wife, so... Yeah, I think, you know, I don't really think I need to ask, I could ask a question. Um, no, I'm not sure I need to. Um, yeah, so then Jehovah's Witness believes... Well, I suppose if I start firstly, like, um, my ex-wife and I were married when I was 19 and she was 18. So we were married quite young, as many people who are Jehovah's Witnesses do marry quite young. Uh, because they don't believe in premarital sex or anything like that. And my first son we had when we were 20, I was 22, Mary was 21, uh, sorry, Sheree was 21. And uh, the, the reality is that Sheree basically fell out of love with me seven years into our marriage. So or six, around six years into our marriage. And she became interested in another person, but she didn't feel brave enough to leave me and go off with that other person. And I'm not sure whether the other person wanted to be with her anyway. And so she sort of stayed in our marriage, even though she didn't really love me for that period of time. So we then stayed married for another seven years. And I knew that she didn't love me, but um, it was during that time that I sort of, know, well, basically did not love her anymore. I felt like um, I felt like the soulmate issue was really important to me. I wanted to find out who my soulmate was, and I believed at the time another person was. I had didn't have a relationship with her or anything, but I believed she was, and I also didn't feel like um, Sheree was my soulmate. So, so. I, I knew that by the time I got to the point where I didn't love Sheree, I knew that I couldn't live with her anymore. And although she could live with me still, the problem with the Jehovah's Witness faith is that Sheree would have probably left me seven years prior if she had felt able to without losing her family and her friends. But in the Jehovah's Witness faith, if you leave your husband or wife and have a relationship with somebody else, then you are usually either disassociated or disfellowship, which means that you no longer get to see your family or your friends either. So it's like a complete cut off from your entire world. And of course, Sheree didn't feel brave enough to do that. And so she stayed with me. But I knew that I could not stay with her and, and not, you know, to, in my mind, I had, had to love her if I was gonna stay with her. And I knew I didn't love her and so I felt I couldn't stay with her. And that was the reason why I left. But I also knew that if I left, she would be bound by this underlying rule that the Jehovah's Witness have that if, if you um, are left by a partner, but that partner who leaves you does not engage sexually with anyone else, then you're not free to remarry. So it's all to do with the sexual relationship. Like if the partner who leaves you does not have a sexual relationship with anyone else, then basically you cannot remarry, you cannot have a relationship with anyone either. And I didn't want to leave Sheree, my ex-wife, in the position where she was not able to have a relationship with somebody else. So that's the reason why I chose to do what I did. Does that make sense? At the time, I thought it made sense. <laughs> it doesn't make much sense to me now, of course. None of that makes any sense to me now. So I would just now, if it was now, I would just leave. <laughs> and I certainly wouldn't choose to have other people believe lies about my leaving either. But that's the way it went at the time. What do you mean about lies about the way you... Um, well, left? you know, I said that I saw a prostitute, which is not the same as being with one, but I knew they would interpret that as meaning that I'd had sexual relations with the prostitute. Nobody actually asked me whether I had or not. Fortunately, because then I would have had to say, no, I haven't had any sexual relations with the prostitute. But, um, but nobody asked me because they wanted to believe that I had had sexual relations with the prostitute. And that 
is what enabled Sheree, my ex-wife, to be able to remarry without waiting for me to have a relationship with somebody else. Under their rules, if you like. So, how was your life afterwards? How were you treated then? Well, as a result of my actions, um, my family didn't speak to me anymore, my friends didn't speak to me anymore, I lost all of my family and friends, and eventually the witnesses convinced my two children that they should treat me as if I'm already dead. And so they didn't speak to me anymore for nearly two years. And so I lost quite a lot. At the time, I was pretty sad and, uh, and I just didn't see much point in life. I wasn't going to kill myself, but I felt like dying. And, um, and I, I basically um, had nobody to talk to as well. So eventually I went and saw somebody who I could speak to about the whole thing to get rid of some of the emotions about it. But it was a pretty traumatic time of my life. And in fact, uh, the people who spoke to me, the witness people who spoke to me, they're called elders. And some of them recommended that I'd be better off killing myself than leaving my wife, uh, actually. Um, and that, that's partly some of their beliefs, that when you, when you do what they call sin against God or whatever, and I don't believe it is a sin against God, but they do. And when you sin against God, they believe that basically you might as well be dead because that is what's going to happen to you in the long run. And so they encouraged my sons to treat me as if I was already dead. And they encouraged my family to treat me as if I was already dead. And, um, and so I didn't get to speak with anybody during that time. So as you can imagine, it was a pretty emotional, traumatic time. And, and I really struggled during that time emotionally to cope with a lot of the emotions that came up as a result. So how did that make you feel then, sort of being cut off from your... Because I think if I was in a vulnerable position and my family just completely cut me out of their lives, yeah. you know, I'd, I'd feel pretty hurt by that. Yeah, I realised that to survive I was going to have to emotionally let go of everything that I believed in and felt was true up until that time, even about my family. And eventually I came to feel actually that everyone was my family, that I don't, I don't see myself as having a family anymore. I see the whole human race as my family and I don't have any special connection to my, you know, my birth family, if you like, as a result because I've let go of all those emotions, really. And I don't, ha and I, to do that, I had to feel a lot of grief. So I, I did a lot of crying during that period of my life and let go of a lot of feelings that I had about, you know, family should always back you up and family should always support you and all those kind of beliefs. Um, and eventually I came to see that, no, they didn't have to support me and they had their own beliefs and they were entitled to have their own beliefs. Uh, it didn't mean that I have to that I had to agree with them, but I felt that um, their beliefs were wrong, just like they felt that mine were, and I was okay with that after that period of time. And ironically, about that period of time, my two sons, who wouldn't speak to me up until that point, came to live with me, um, and they also, over that period of time, left the faith as well. So, um, so how did that make you feel that your sons were? Um, in the faith of, uh, 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 sorry, I'll start question again. Um, how did that make you feel that, that your sons were in the faith, but yet something that you completely didn't believe in, and and they treated you so badly? How did that make you feel? Um, yeah, I, I didn't have any. This is one of the things that helped me a lot with my relationship with God, actually, because I realised that even though my sons didn't want to see me. I still loved them. And even though I disagreed with their course of action, I still loved them. And even though what I, I felt that their actions towards myself were unloving, I still loved them. And, and so what that helped me understand was that if God is better than the average human, and I believe quite strongly, I always have believed quite strongly that God is better than the average human, I realized that the same thing applied to me. If I was doing something 
that God didn't agree with, God would still love me and God would just hope that at some point in the future I'll realise what I'm doing um, is wrong, you know, and, would, and that I'd try to address that. And, and so it helped me go through a lot of emotions about God, actually, that I had up until that time. Obviously, because I was a member of a Christian faith, I had a lot of beliefs about God. Um, I don't, I, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe Jesus is God, so, um, and I, I know Jesus is my God because I know who I am. But, um, but, but we always had that they always had this focus, if you like, on God and God's opinions. But God's opinions were based around what they believed the Bible said. And I realized that a lot of the things during that period of time, I realized that a lot of things the Bible said about God were not true. And in particular, that God is a punishing God, a wrathful God who punishes the wicked and wants to destroy the wicked. I realized all the way through that period of time that none of that was true. And that, and that really helped me a lot to allow myself to have the memories that I had all my life to come up again, really. Because, it, because it, up until then, my allowance of my memories was very much dependent upon my belief system, which was very fixed. And so it, it helped me a lot. But, so I, I didn't have any feelings of animosity towards my sons. Um, I, I at times had feelings of unjust feelings with my ex-wife because she was often lying about whether I was providing child support and other things like that. Um, but, uh, but eventually my sons learned the truth of all of those kind of things and eventually um, as a result of what they learned through the process they came to live with me anyway. So, so when my sons were, my youngest son was um, who was 14, nearly 15, when he came to live with me, and my oldest son was 18 when he came to live with me. So, yeah. And we get along great, as you'll see. You know, you'll possibly meet one of my sons while you're here, so, yeah. So who was the first person that you told um, that you were Jesus, or who's the first person you confided in? Uh, my Both of my sons, actually, yeah. I, I felt... Uh, by that stage, I was developing properties, and they lived in a property uh, about an hour away from where I lived that I owned. And um, and up until for the first year or so of my realizations of coming to terms psychologically of who I was, I didn't tell anybody. But after a while, I felt that I should tell at least my sons. And so I, I explained to them what I'd been going through. Just let me have a good cough, particularly in the throat. Okay. <coughs> it's a shame that we're not going to hear the karaoke from you. I was, I was looking forward to that. Oh, yeah. I was looking forward to it. Oh, can we... Yeah, is I... there any way, if your voice is up for it? Well, we'll see, we'll see yeah. We'll see. We'll, see. we'll see how I feel. But after talking for a couple of hours... It's not going to help. If the me. voice isn't good, yeah. I've got to it's save it for the next day, at least. Is it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know, I was looking forward to that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, what was the question? It was, the question is... Um, what did my so, sons? So how yeah. did they react to saying you were Jesus? Yeah, how did, how, how did your sons react to you were Jesus? Um, my eldest son said, no worries, that's all cool, Dad. I don't know if I believe that you're Jesus, but uh, no worries. I understand you must be going through some things, you know, like, and they asked me a bit about my memories, and I told them some of the memories that I had. Um, and so my older son felt that way. My younger son actually was a said, I believe that totally, actually. <laughs> He's my younger son. He now lives down in Tasmania, um, which is like 3,000 kilometres from here. But he, uh, at the time, that's what he said. And the irony is now that they've almost switched their opinions. <laughs> so now my oldest son feels that I, he knows that I am, whereas my younger son has his doubts. Yeah. But we talk frequently, so... You know, it makes no difference to our relationship or anything. Yeah. They're really great men, you know. Yeah, my youngest son's 27. Uh, 27. Actually, he was 27 yesterday. Was he? I think so. August the 
eights or nines. Can't Did you have this special remedy for looking so um, young? Because the uh, fact that your youngest son is 27. My older son's 29. Yep. Right. So, um, no, I, I feel that's a lot to do with relationship with God and love. Like, I do feel it's a lot to do with those things. Um, I expect to get younger rather than older. Explain ex- to me about that. Well, as you deal with the emotional impediments, or let's call it emotional injuries that cause damage to your physical body, as you release them from your from your soul, then your physical body has the way has the manner to replicate itself, so that there is no damage in the process of the replication process. So, as most people may be aware. Um, Usually every seven years, every single cell in our body is actually a different cell than it was seven years ago. Our body has this complete replication process that every cell in the body replicates itself. But the problem for the average person is that we have emotional injuries which impact upon the replication process. So once we hit 24 or 25 years of age, the emotional injuries start imposing themselves upon us so strongly that the replication process of the cells is no longer perfect in its operation. And so instead of having the cells replicate and therefore you know, be renewed every seven years, uh, we have each new cell that's being produced having damage that's part of the damage of the old cell that's died. And as a result of that, we age and eventually and it's caused through some genetic, some, a gene inside of the DNA. And eventually we get so old that our body, some of our body organs start to decay so much that eventually we die. We can't sustain life anymore. Once we become at one with God, this replication process perfects itself. And so if the closer we get to at one with God, the younger we will start to get. And by the time we become at one with God, we will probably look around 25 to 30 years of age, you know, that ideal age that we have where we're fully mature, but we're not growing old anymore. And our body's cells can re- sustain that process for the rest of our existence in a state of at one with God. So we could conceivably live on earth forever if we wanted to, um, in that place. However, um, of course, it doesn't mean you can't die because you could still have an accident or you could still have um, somebody else having an accident that affects you or you could still have somebody deciding to harm you and that would cause your death. But you wouldn't be able to die through uh, your own, through, through the destructive process of cell replication that currently occurs. Does that make so sense? no disease would exist, or no disease would be able to. When you're at one with God, there's no disease, there's no sickness, there's no death, as we know it. You know, when I say there's no death, there's no death that's caused by the degradation of the cellular structure of the human physical body. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying that AIDS, cancer, everything, everything. There's no way you can actually even get an illness of any kind in that place. Is anybody actually at one with God? Now on earth? Yeah. No. No one. It's a process that um, I'm trying to teach people how to go through and historically there's only ever been one person who was at one with God on earth and that was myself in the first century. And that happened when I was 30 years of age, 31 years of age, in the counting of Jewish time at the time. But what we would call nowadays 30 years of age. So so before then I was going through the same process as I'm going now, going through now. And I have a memory of that process, so it's a bit easier for me to engage it than the average person, I suppose. Um, but it's a process and it takes time in the first century it took me 13 years to consciously engage that process. I've been consciously engaging the process now for nearly 10 years and I suspect it will take me probably at least another five before I become one with God in this life. So, so um, why do people get illnesses? I know you're saying that 
um, if they're not at one with God. Yep. Um, so, for instance, if somebody says, all right, they go to the doctor and they find out they've got cancer. Yep. Why does that happen? Each illness has an emotional reason that is different. That, it, in, in other words, there's a soul-based cause. Um, and if I can sort of explain it from a very sort of basic layman's terms initially, and then we can go into the more technical parts of it. From a, from a very basic perspective, every time that we in our soul act or feel out of harmony with love, we are allowing an opening for a disease or a sickness or an illness to occur within our own body. When we are completely in harmony with God's laws of love, there is no way that any illness in our body can actually occur. But each illness has its own emotional signature. It has a reason emotionally why it's being caused. So it depends on what part of the body, what the illness is, and what areas of the body are affected as to what the underlying cause of each specific illness it is. And, but when we become at one with God and therefore we become perfected in love, there is no openings whatsoever, whatsoever anymore for any illness to occur in our physical body. And so we become, basically we become uh, immune to everything. So you can think of it, so you, if you think nowadays, the way we develop immunity generally is we have a sickness and then our body over a period of time builds up a degree of immunity to that particular sickness, depending on the type of sickness it is. But if it's a viral sickness in particular, it will develop generally an immunity if we survive the illness, right? And the immunity is developed uh, as a natural process in our body. What I'm suggesting is that when our soul, our, our emotional state is in complete harmony with love, I'm suggesting that we have immunity on every issue, on every physical issue that could occur. So we are completely immune from any physical illness that could potentially develop in our body. And we are also immune from aging as well. So and that's how God created it. So if you think about it, disease is a feedback system telling us that something inside of ourselves is out of harmony with love. That's, that's the feedback system. So every time we enter a disease, a sickness, an illness, a cold, a flu, any physical thing happens to our body, there's, there's something that was out of harmony with love that caused that to occur. And this even applies to things that are caused by external factors, such as insects biting us that carry a disease, for example. The reality is once we're at one with God, no insect will actually bite us because we are completely in harmony with all of God's creations. <coughs> Get the cough yeah. Sorry, Sam. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, you know what surprises me the most about people who believe in God is they seem to think that God created an imperfect system and we've all just got to tolerate this imperfect system. But God created a perfect system and and the reality is all we've done as humans is walked away from love and so we've created, we are the ones who've created the imperfection in the system. And the imperfection in the system results in feedback and part of the feedback is illness and disease and sickness and accidents and all of these kind of things which happen to us which cause our own distress. They are things that happen to us because we have stepped away from the perfect system God made by our soul becoming more unloving, by our choices, if you like, by the use of our will, we have chosen to become more unloving with ourselves and with each other. And as a result, we have now introduced imperfection into the system. And part of the imperfection in the system is the diseases and the illnesses that happen as a result. So our bodies are created to to correct every illness, right? right inside of our bodies at the moment. There are so many diseases that could kill us. 
but the reality is our own immune system is capable of handling those particular diseases and keeping them away from overcoming our body. And the only reason why that's possible is because we have a certain degree of love left inside of us that allows this to occur. But the more out of harmony with love we become, and usually the older we get, the more out of harmony with love we become, we impose more and more sicknesses and diseases that we cannot any longer fight. And as a result of that, we eventually um, become overcome by one of these diseases and usually that's the way in which we die uh, many, in many, most occasions. So I feel if most people considered that God only creates, though, particularly those people who believe in God, consider that God only creates a perfect system and any imperfection that is in this system that we're living in is at the result of our own creations then we would be far more circumspect about the way in which we use our own will. And one of the main reasons why Mary and I have come to Earth again is to teach people about the unloving and loving use of your own will. Because we feel it's one of the most important things we, humanity needs to understand. If we all understood that we could use our will in complete harmony with love and therefore go back to the perfect system that God created, then um, there'd be a lot more happiness on the earth. And also I feel a lot more, a lot less cynicism and a lot less skepticism and, and all of these other kinds of things that are results of thousands and thousands of years of humanity using its will out of harmony with love. Okay, you want to say? Yeah. This might be a silly question, but what do you mean by love? Well, I define love the way God defines love and not the way humanity defines love. So um, the way people on earth define love is often if, if you do something for me, then I have to do something for you in return. Well, I don't call that love, I call that duty. <laughs> and that's not love. Love is, some, love is a feeling that comes from your heart where you honor and respect and care for every single person and yourself and every single being around you that's love and and once it's brought into harmony with god's way of loving because that's the way god loves then there is no room for any disease there is no room for any illness there is no room for any destructive thing to occur on the earth if you look at all of the things that are happening on earth right at this present day all of them are happening as a result of our inability to love truly love we we instead we sacrifice things for other things so in other words we sacrifice the landscape for loving ourselves now if we truly loved we would never do that we would love the landscape and love ourselves and we are capable of loving both at the same time we are capable of not destroying one for the sake of the other but unfortunately humanity has learned that the only way to love one thing is to destroy another thing in order to love one thing. So in other words, we've learnt that, for example, the average person on the planet eats meat, right? So we've learned that, oh, if I love myself, I'm going to enjoy meat and therefore I'm going to eat meat and therefore if I, then I have to kill an animal in order to love myself. And I don't agree with that. I don't agree you have to kill an animal in order to love yourself. Just stop eating meat and you can still have a lot of tasty food. <laughs> Um, but you can also then love animals. And if you look at the reasons why we remove a lot of the vegetation on the planet, it's because we eat meat. In fact, the majority of the de deforestation that has occurred on the planet has occurred as a result of trying to provide more meat-based food to the population of the world. If we stopped eating meat, we would naturally stop a lot of these processes of destructive processes. So, so the reality is I feel quite different to what most people believe. I feel that we're capable, humanity is capable of loving everything. And as a result of loving everything, we bring ourselves into harmony with love, into harmony with God's love. As a result of bringing ourselves into harmony with that love, we will also feel the positive effects of that love in our own body, which means that we would no longer experience disease and suffering based on diseases and sicknesses. So how would you explain um Okay, sir. Yeah, okay, mate. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Go ahead, but I'll just Okay. How would you explain... Which uh, hotel, sorry, which hotel is it about? Yeah, uh, it's, as you, just before our server on the right. Oh, yeah, it's not a bad hotel, but yeah. Okay, cool. That's good. <laughs> um, how would you explain um, things like malaria and children dying of that? Well, most of these diseases, again, are naturally occurring diseases which our body should be able to um, fight against as long as our body is in complete harmony with love, as long as we don't have emotions within us that have been usually imposed upon us by our environment that are out of harmony with love our body will be able to fight any of these uh, diseases and and actually not even experience them in, in, in all cases. So whenever anybody experiences disease of any kind it's because the, of the lack of love that's either ex that exists within the soul of the individual that is usually caused by, and in case of children is always caused, by the lack of love in the parents and in society generally. So almost everything, well, everything that actually occurs, so this is the motel, everything that actually occurs, I'll just pull over here, um, inside of the body of an, any, any individual, anything that occurs inside the body of any individual occurs because of the environmental conditions that have created soul-based feelings inside of the individual that are out of harmony with love. Now, in the case of a child, usually those feelings are being caused by their parents or their immediate environment. So often, and this is what happens with multi-generational problems, is that the parents have certain emotional belief systems and belief systems that are out of harmony with love. These, these belief systems and emotions which are in their soul, as soon as the child is conceived, the, so the ch child starts receiving these, these beliefs and, and emotions. And so the child, by the time the child is born, has already got a susceptibility to disease and a susceptibility to colds and a susceptibility to other flu to, to things like that. And their body has to develop immunities. I, I suggest to people that if, if they were in complete harmony with love at the time of conception of their child, the child would actually be born with, with immunity to everything and would not have any potential of being able to be harmed by any disease, whether the disease is caused by an external influence or an internal one. So whether the disease is caused by some kind of insect or some kind of bug or some kind of virus or some kind of uh, uh, bacteria or any, kind of, or, or any kind of external influence, none of those things would have an effect on the, on the child because the child, in the condition of love, the love inside of the child affects both the physical and spiritual bodies in such a way that the energy systems of both bodies work perfectly and so therefore there is no way that any bug that enters the, the body can actually generate and, and grow. There's no, no way for it to grow. All of them grow as a result of us being out of harmony with love, not in harmony with love. Just explain like in areas like the third world, it's not when you say out of harmony with love, it's not necessarily even an attack feeling or a nasty feeling inside of the parents is they lack self-love themselves and they've been taught yes. by oppressive so let's, so let's clarify it. In harmony with love requires that we be in harmony with love of ourselves. One of the main reasons why we catch many viruses and other illnesses is because we don't love ourselves. We have learned to not love ourselves. We've been taught in fact often from a very very young age to not love ourselves. Often our parents don't love themselves. And how can a parent who doesn't love themselves truly teach a child how to love itself? They can't. And so the child learns to not love itself. So many of the diseases that occur on this planet are the result of a lack of self-love, actually. They are the result of a lack of uh, care of ourselves. And this is why you'll notice that when we don't care for ourselves, we become highly susceptible to viruses. Now, most people catch a flu when they're already run down, when they're already, you know, feeling stressed out and they're already feeling run down. Well, that's because they're already not loving themselves. If they love themselves, they wouldn't ever allow themselves to get into a run down condition. If they really love themselves, they would not ever allow themselves to, um, to uh, you know, fit, to put, be placed in constant condition of stress 
which causes the degradation of their own body systems in such a way that eventually makes them susceptible to disease. The reality is that if we care for ourselves and learn how to care for ourselves properly, uh, the majority of us would experience hardly any diseases at all. Most of our illnesses, if you think of our viral illnesses, colds and flus and those kind of things, most of those kind of illnesses are all caused, usually we, we're run down before we get them. So we're already not loving ourselves before we get them. And the getting of them is, a, is an indication that we're run down and we need to, we need to love ourselves more. Yeah. So uh, the majority, when, when I talk about a lack of love on the planet, the majority of people think about the love of other, others coming towards themselves. But that's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the lack of love that a person has for themselves. That's the biggest problem on the planet. And the majority of people have very little love or care for themselves. And as a result, they become very, very open and susceptible to many forms of diseases and illnesses. Um, <coughs> of course, not all diseases and illnesses are caused by a lack of love of yourself, because there are diseases and illnesses like cancer, for example, that are caused by a lack of love of others. And they are caused by the way in which you interact with others, the demands that you have upon others, the internal rage that you project upon others, the passive aggressiveness that you project upon others and so forth. And these kind of things are all out of harmony with love and they all have an effect on our body. So how you behave to somebody else. Yes. And it's not so much how, it's not just how you behave, because that's about action, but how you feel about them. It's more about how you feel about them than how you behave. Of course, how you behave is usually the result of how you feel. But how you feel about others and how you feel about yourselves is the key part of love. So if you feel love for another person, you would never want to be angry with them. You'd never be condescending with them even. You, you, would, you would always be open. You would always allow them to have their own use of their will. And the only time you'd want to restrict their will is if you could see that their will was affecting lots of people in a negative direction. And when I say negative, in the sense that it would be out of harmony with love. So in my mind, a person is standing up and saying the truth, that's not affecting anybody in a negative direction. But, but many people in the media and in the government would suggest that it is. Um, so know. in a way, what, so that's a very interesting point. So in a way, you, be, you could be doing something that could have a negative effect and be out of harmony with love for an individual that's actually watching you or listening to you. Yes. Yep. What's that question? could do something that would be out of because of people because of people's interpretation or understanding yes um, or preconceptions that they have of AJ mm -hmm. um, by listening to AJ yep and the feeling it's, it's quite difficult the feeling that they um, can have can be AJ could be doing something which in their world is out of harmony with love. It, it, in it's their world yes. is out of harmony with It's perceived with. as being out exactly. of harmony with love. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not. Yes. But yeah. it's not. Yeah, yeah. See, so, so when I talk about being in harmony with love, I'm always talking about God's perception of love. In other words, God's, if you like, what, what are God's laws about the issues of love? And God's laws are very, very different about love than humans' laws about love. So, for example, um, if an unwed mother has a child on this earth, um, when she gives away this child to a couple who want to bring up a child, many times she would be looked down upon as if she hasn't been a good mother. But from God's perspective, if she is incapable of bringing up this child with love, then her wisest and love, most loving course of action would be to give away the child. So quite often, God's perspective is very different than human perspective. And, and uh, another, uh, another way we could look at it is, you see a big issue now worldwide is this issue of whether gay people should be able to marry, right? Well, from God's perspective, everyone should be able to marry, right? If, if the right is given to one person from God's perspective, it should be given to all people. So if, if, if heterosexual people are allowed to marry, then homosexual people should be allowed to marry from God's perspective. But from human perspective, well, they go down the track, with, but they believe God says this and other people believe, you know, religion says that and all these man-made laws get made, plus there's a lot of homophobia on the planet. And as a result of all of these kind of things, 
whenever somebody talks about a gay couple being marrying, a, a normal Christian will think, how terrible, it's an abomination, and it's terrible, and they have all this judgment, but they don't realize that they're doing exactly what the Bible says not to do, which is to judge another person, right? And, and for, so from God's perspective, the Christian is more out of harmony with love by condemning the gay couple marrying than the gay couple are to get married. The gay couple aren't out of harmony with love. The gay couple aren't out of harmony with love at all. And the Christian who's condemning them or judging them is more out of harmony with love than the gay couple, right? And so therefore, the Christian is in a darker place emotionally from God's perspective than the gay couple who's getting married because they love each other and they want to get married. One last question, just because I know we probably all want to get out of the car, sorry. Um, you right, Si? Yeah, all good. Okay. Um, uh, I'm interested, so how would you, how would you explain so, a child that's born with Down syndrome? Oftentimes with, uh, with our emotional injuries, our emotional injuries get so bad that the, pardon me, the cell replication process becomes so distorted that certain genetic imperfections start arising within the cell replication process. And so what happens at this point in time is, is a person may conceive a child, but the child's genetic structure, the body of the child itself, has now been impacted by the parents so much, by the parents' emotional condition so much, that now there is a distortion in the child's genetic structure as a result of the emotion that exists within the parent. Does that make sense? And, and usually it's both parents. So as a result, you get this distortion in the child's genetic structure, which then exhibits itself in some manner. And, and Down syndrome is one of these manners in which the chromosomal, uh, there are chromosomal problems with, your DNA, with the DNA, and, and as a result, you get a Down syndrome child. The soul is still a soul, a soul that has been created by God. So there's still the child who's the soul God, that God loves. And the Down syndrome is just another physical impediment that is imposed upon the body of a child through one particular emotional injury that is stronger in those particular parents than any other parents. And, uh, and, and it's only one. Every single emotional thing that occurs has a specific a recurring genetic problem and physical problem that it allows. So, for example, every woman that has breast cancer in the right breast has the same emotional problem. Which is? Well, in a case in the right breast, it's, it's due to her relationship with men and her passive aggressive rage that she wants men to to approve, she wants men to do things for her and approve of her in order to make some of her sadness go away. And that's why she gets a, a cancer develop in her breast. Now, many women on the planet feel that way towards men. And so, of course, breast cancer in the right breast is a very common thing. And, uh, but every single physical illness has a specific emotional cause. Every single one. Every single genetic problem that uh, occurs in a child has a specific emotional cause in its parents. Every single one. And we have the ability to cure all of these. Mankind has the ability to cure them all, but only by knowing what the cause is. And what we're doing when we're chasing after physical solutions is we're ignoring the cause. The cause is emotional. The cause is the emotions that are out of harmony with love, out of harmony with love of self, out of harmony with love of others that cause these particular problems. And you can actually document every single one, and we are scientifically able to do this, document every single emotional cause and emotional effect and disease-based cause, that, you know, every cause of every disease, tracing it from its emotional source. Um, but there's a general reluctance in the scientific community and the medical community to do it at this point in time. But in the future, you'll find we'll start doing it like there'll be more and more people will become aware and we'll start doing it. So do you know, sorry, are you okay, sorry? Do I know the emotional causes of most diseases? Yeah, I think that's the question, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sir? Yep. Are you, are you okay? Yep, I'm good. You sure? I'm good, yeah, I'm positive. Okay. Um, so do you know the emotional ca causes to diseases? To most diseases, yes. Um, you know, the many of the emotional causes are very, very obvious, actually, because you can feel the emotion that's consistent in each person who has that particular disease. 
So, so it's very easy to tell once you can feel the emotions of each person to feel what the actual cause is. But, but yes, we can document all of these things. So it, this could be a, an area of scientific endeavour that people haven't engaged at this point in time. And, and, and within, within 10 years, we could have a full documentation of almost every single disease on the planet and what its underlying emotional cause is. When you think about it, then we could go through how to release that particular emotion. And then we could also measure whether that has an effect on the cure of the disease. Right? So from a scientific perspective, we could actually prove everything that I'm saying if people were willing to engage the scientific process of actually examining the relationship. So if the ninja's about to die... Tom. Okay. This is... If... If I was to present some a woman mm -hmm. and she had breast cancer in the right breast mm -hmm. and she was open-minded and willing to engage, mm -hmm. could you... Or could I know it will be her that's curing herself? It is. But could her, you it? could you could you talk her through that process to actually she could, if she was engaging enough, could actually cure herself? Certainly, certainly. However, by the time a disease becomes present within the human body, it usually is an indication that we were already in huge denial of the emotions that cause it. So it's highly, like it's very irregular to find a person who's in such a condition, who wants to actually deal with the emotion. So I've spoken to many women who have cancer in their right breast, for example, and told them what the cause is. And they completely deny that's their cause, and then they finish up dying of breast cancer. Because there is so much resistance to the idea or concept that they may have something inside of themselves that's out of harmony with love that is causing the problem. They want to blame something else. They want it to be some other reason. And this is the problem with most people on earth with the comes to disease and illness. We want it to be something that's not within ourselves. We want it to be caused by something else. Because also, if, you th if it's a, a parent mm -hmm. or parents mm -hmm. and you have a child, so according to what you believe, your child has Down syndrome, yep. and that's because of how you have behaved. No, that's, no, no, it's no. not because of how oh, you've sorry, behaved. How you, how you feel. It's your, about... It's about soul-based emotions that exist in you. And remember that your soul-based emotions possibly came from your parents. So it's a long line of soul-based emotions that have, that have built up over a long period of time, usually okay. generations. So, so when I talk about the soul-based causes within an individual, please understand that I'm not blaming the individual because the individual can't be blamed because it's a long chain of genetic passing down and emotional passing down from generation to generation these illnesses that have occurred. So eventually the passing down in increases so much that eventually the latest generation gets a disease that, that gets passed down. So you can't then say, oh, the generation that caused that is the only cause, right? We need to understand what the causes are, but we need to not judge the persons who are involved in the cause because they aren't the only cause. The, the cause is a long line of decisions that have been made by generations of humankind and, and the way to fix it can be fixed in one generation. So like you can fix all of these things in one generation, but, but unfortunately what we do is we don't, we, we take everything so personally, right? What we do is we go, oh, what AJ is saying or Jesus is saying to me is that I'm the cause of my own illness. Oh, how dare you say that? You know, we get all personal about it. I'm not, I'm not judging the person. I'm just saying there's emotions inside of you passed down through generations of people before you that are now within your soul caused and passed down through the environment as well. The environment is a large part of this. And that you now have inside of yourself that are the causes of your own diseases and your own illnesses. And if you're willing to let go of them and release them, you can become cured of every single disease and illness. Isn't that fantastic? Like, to me, that's a positive thing. That's not a negative thing. Um, and the same applies to a Down syndrome child. Actually, the next replication, so once the parents heal the cause inside of themselves that have passed down to them over generations, the child has the ability now, if it's a young child in particular, has the ability to replicate its own cell structure with complete perfection. In other words, there, there can be a genetic modification of the next generation of cells in their physical body, which will cause them to, not, no, long, to no longer have Downs. So we could actually cure Downs while the child's alive, right? Not the next generation, 
the child in the child itself that has Downs. In the child itself. Yeah. So good